Thank you very much indeed. It's a, a great joy to be here and to be able to talk about this issue, um, as you say, in a fairly unbuttoned frame. What I want to do this evening is to look at some of those aspects of our contemporary world which make the ethics of warfare more difficult than they've been for quite a long time, and to see if there's anything at all in classical approaches to the ethics of warfare that can be salvaged in a new environment, a new moral environment. Is there a new ethic for warfare? Are we anywhere near deciding what it might be? Because many of us are familiar with the theme of the criteria for a just war. These criteria, hammered out over several centuries in the Western Middle Ages, have a good deal of clarity about them, but unfortunately they don't map very well onto the actual facts of armed conflict in the latter part of the 20th and the beginning of the 21st century. Increasingly they read rather like parenting handbooks, whose major problem is of course that the babies haven't read the books. <laughs> and so with a lot of armed conflict in the last few decades, combatants haven't read the books. This is not textbook warfare. And I want to focus that particularly by speaking a little bit on one particular cluster of theories that's come to the fore in the last five or six years, particularly in the last two years, actually, um, with the help of that formidable social thinker, Mary Caldor. In October 2012, Mary Caldor published a very substantial article on the new warfare in which she elaborated some of the themes she'd sketched in earlier work, describing what had changed in the climate of armed conflict in recent decades. And here are some of the problems she identifies. And I'm going to add a couple of problems that I would want to put in as well. One of the first and most important is what she calls the confusion of public and private agents confusion of public and private agents. Who is actually conducting warfare these days? Just war theory tends to take it for granted that you have two legitimate governments fighting over some identifiable question to do with hegemony or territory or whatever. But we're increasingly now, of course, talking about a war on terror, which means that it's no longer about two legitimate sovereign powers the private and the public merge. And what's the ethic appropriate for that context? And that, of course, can be expressed in slightly different terms, as Mary Caldor does, by talking about the confusion between state and non-state agents. Warfare is not primarily, in the last couple of decades, between states. And yet a great deal of our ethical discussion in the past has assumed without question that's the paradigm to sovereign states. Another factor which she draws attention to is a confusion between what she calls internal and external. Conflict within states, conflict between states, and conflict which spills over in all directions conflict within states which can become a conflict between states, another state becoming a sort of shadow agent in a civil war. Not unfamiliar in Africa, as of course it's not unfamiliar in other theatres like the Vietnam War in the 60s. Wars being fought by proxy. Wars being subsidised by other state powers and sometimes, of course, subsidized by non-state agencies as well. Most of the most costly conflict in Central and Latin America these days is to do with drug businesses, as we know. Do we talk about war there? And I'm not talking about that silly metaphor, the war on drugs, which is so popular in some quarters. I mean actual armed conflict, stimulated and sustained by large 
commercial interests in the production of narcotic drugs, destabilizing entire countries and entire economies. The recent history of Mexico or Colombia will illustrate that point. And then Mary Calder also points to what she calls provocatively the blurring of the boundaries between war and crime. At what point does violent, forcible action against other agents, other states, other populations become criminal violence? We're not so sure. And we've lost quite a lot of the traditional moral compass which would have allowed us to say once that certain kinds of activity were in all circumstances criminal, such as torture. Most of us probably still believe that to be the case, that torture is in all circumstances criminal. There is real debate about that, of course, in the United States. And one or two, um, I'm not quite sure whether to say celebrated or infamous essays in recent years in the American press have argued the case for extreme interrogation as a legitimate method. So war and crime, the boundaries don't seem to be quite so firm as they once were. Professor Calder makes a very good case, I think, for all of these factors being involved in reshaping what we take for granted about armed conflict. But I would want to make two qualifications or additional points before moving on. The first is that I'd want to add two other factors which I think have complicated the situation with armed conflict. One of them is the fact of technological imbalance in armed conflict. And the ideal that some strategists held before us of the half-hour war. With sufficient technological resource, you ought to be able to win a war in half an hour, says the fantasy. But bracketing the science fiction side of that, the real and serious point there is, I believe, the increasing, what shall I say, asymmetry of risk or vulnerability in conflict when one side has a monumental technological advantage such as access to drones. How do you map that onto a classical interstate just war pattern. You can't. So technological imbalance, or asymmetry of risk, however you want to put it, the massive inequality in technical resource between so-called combatants is also a factor. And I think refining slightly what Mary Calder says about state and non-state and private and public, the question that has become focused certainly since the, the Gulf Wars, what is now the legitimate authority for violent action? The decision of a sovereign state, meaning the decision of the commander-in-chief or the decision of the political executive? The common mind of an alliance, say NATO, the license of the United Nations or some other international body, what is a defensible, legitimate authority for initiating some sort of violent action? So two other factors which further complicate the picture. And then one other pair of considerations about Mary Calder's structure, which is that I think there are probably two kinds of new war, not just one. And I'd want to modify her theory slightly in these terms. And the two kinds of new war are, first of all, endemic civil conflict spilling across national borders. If I simply mention the activities of the Lord's Resistance Army in Central and East Africa, you'll see what I mean. There is an ongoing situation of extreme violent conflict involving several governments, involving a non-state actor, that is the LRA, operating across several national boundaries. And quite clearly, unlike almost anything that we've had to think about before, in the number of bodies, the number of national agents involved in responding 
to the LRA and in the mobility of the LRA itself across boundaries, from Chad to Sudan to bits of Kenya to northern Uganda, the LRA is active and still a major problem. So that's one kind of new war. The other, rather obviously, is interventionist multinational conflict, the Iraq War, the interventions in Afghanistan. Multinationally prompted and sanctioned conflicts which are not about responding to immediate military threat, weapons of mass destruction in Iraq um, bracketed for the moment, but are about, at times, what purports to be humanitarian or democratically oriented intervention for the sake of the greater good of a population, an extension of what people in UN circles refer to as the responsibility to protect or duty to protect. Does a nation have a duty to protect the population of another sovereign nation against its own government? Does an international consortium of nations have a right or a duty to protect citizens against their government? That's the rationale often advanced for intervention in somewhere like Iraq. Its selectivity is very apparent, and I needn't um, underline that point. But there is a serious issue there about the novelty of what's assumed as proper there. There are other issues which, given a bit more time, I'd be glad to enlarge on. It may be that in questions you'd like to pick up some more detail about this. I just mention in passing the prevalence in some conflict theatres of child soldiering, that is the abduction of children, the forcing of them into often the most atrocious kinds of violent action, and the increasing routine use of gender-based violence as a tool of warfare, a deliberate tool of warfare to humiliate and intimidate. In other words, forms of conflict that are very deeply marked by intimidation rather than strategy. Gender-based violence is, of course, no new thing in warfare. The brutal and licentious soldiery have lived up to that reputation in every age, and rape has always been a tool of war. Heterosexual and homosexual rape. That, I think, doesn't alter the fact that in an increasing number of contemporary conflicts, this is more and more deliberately used as an intimidating and humiliating tactic, I won't say strategy, and groups like the LRA and comparable groups in some African settings, and not only African, use this extensively. So the role of women, the role of children in warfare is no longer, it seems, taken for granted as a protected space in the conduct of armed conflict in our time. So how do we respond to this very new situation? Mary Calder has a couple of reflections on this, which I think are very helpful, though they might need some further development. One is that she believes it's very important in this rather chaotic situation to be clear about some of our definitions, that a, what you might call a defense of self-defense, that is saying we are going to war to defend ourselves, should be restricted very, very carefully to defense against the actions of another state. An appeal for self-defense is a lot more complex and a lot more ambivalent when non-state agents are involved. And she believes it's important to be crystal clear that when we talk about self-defense, we really need to be talking about response to actual sovereign state aggression against the sovereign state. And we can't easily enlarge that. And the second um, major point she wants to make, which interests me a great deal, is 
that she insists that we should be clear about what it is that in any decision to go into armed conflict, what it is that we're defending. And she argues that defense is not about maintaining abstract rights of sovereignty. It has to be a defense of the rule of law, the rule of law as a protection of persons. So when we, when and if any state agent initiates violent action in any context, the defense needs to be, says Mary Calder, that we are defending the rule of law. That is, we are defending the right of somebody to appeal to an impartial protection. And that means recasting armed attack, armed violence, to quote her, as a massive violation of human rights, as a humanitarian catastrophe. So the problem with an active threat from another agent is not so much the threat to a national sovereignty and national integrity, it's a threat to the rule of law nationally and internationally, a violation of human rights, a humanitarian catastrophe. And that, I think, does help us imagine a bit how we'd think through the problems around children and women in this connection. So that's the picture that Mary Calder wants to put before us. We have a fast-shifting moral map, strategic map of modern warfare. It doesn't readily reduce itself to a pattern of conflict between sovereign states. It's often a matter of proxy wars, wars between private and public, wars that spill over in different directions across national and other boundaries, and war which increasingly <clears throat> uses what we, most of us would regard as humanitarianly deplorable methods to sustain itself. Does the just war tradition have anything at all to say to this? So in the second part of what I want to say, I'd like to look at some of the ways in which traditional just war theory might and might not map onto that kind of picture of the warfare we're now becoming familiar with. And let me just remind you of some of the basic principles of classic just war theory, just in case not everyone has them instantly in their minds and hasn't recently had to declare a war. Forcible action, violent action, needs to be a last resort. That is, you need to have tried other things first. That's the primary condition for any war that could be regarded as just. Just, of course, meaning defensible, not in itself good. It's axiomatic for just war theorists that war is never a good thing. And for just war theorists from Augustine through to Grotius, that there is no such thing as a holy war. One of the most interesting and odd things in the Middle Ages is watching a populist development of a holy war theory in the Crusades alongside a deep scepticism in the intellectual world about the whole idea. So that Thomas Aquinas would have had great difficulty justifying the Crusades. And as a matter of fact, didn't. That's not a just war. So, yes, first of all, you have to try other things. Second, you have to have clear, identifiable strategies for sparing the innocent, sparing the non-combatant. You have to have clear and distinct ways of drawing the distinction between those who are directly involved and those who are not directly involved in the conflict. Thirdly, you need proportion in what you do. That's to say, you may decide that the way to win this war is, thinking back to the Middle Ages, um, quite simply to um, 
to hang every tenth man in every village you capture. And that will be sufficiently intimidating to, to win you the war. But it won't win you the argument when the theologians take over. <laughs> because proportion, jus in bello, that is lawful behavior in war, not just lawful cause for war, lawful behavior in war is expressed in proportionate response. In other words, you don't take the initiative in ramping up atrocity. And last, these are very rough summaries of the principles, last but not least, you need to know when it's over. You need to know what counts as winning. And if you go into a conflict without an exit strategy, without a clear sense of what it might be to have won this so that you can draw a line, then you will not be entering a just conflict. And that's one which I think is often forgotten in contemporary discussions. It was one that um, some of us did raise about one or two recent conflicts when it seemed not, let's say, absolutely crystal clear what the exit strategy was going to be once you'd overthrown Saddam Hussein or whatever it might be. So th those are very broadly the principles. Now, there are four or five points which seem to me to be salvageable from that rather schematic summary of just war theory that might help us. Those four, as I say, are crafted in an environment where war appeared to be a fairly straightforward matter of state agents or sovereign agents battling with each other. As, as has often been said, medieval theories of just war are, as much as anything, about conflicts between Italian city-states. And there aren't many of those now. So what are the broader things that might be extracted and transferred? Let's think for a moment about proportion. Use in bello, lawful behavior in the conduct of conflict. This principle has its roots in an argument that you find in St. Augustine, who's usually regarded as the creator of just war theory as we know it. So around 400... Augustine is formulating some of these ideas and notably says in his treatise on the city of God that you will delegitimize your own authority if you defend it by illegal or disproportionate methods. You will delegitimize your own authority. You cannot pretend to be defending the rule of law by behaving unlawfully. And that, it seems to me, is a principle which applies whether or not you're talking about conflict with other state agencies or whatever. I think that's a transferable principle. And that's the principle on which Abu Ghraib, for example, is inadmissible as a morally defensible element in any kind of uh, sustained conflict. You delegitimize your own case. You undermine your own position by acting unlawfully. And if there is still a general agreement in international law that torture or extreme forms of interrogation are illegitimate, well, draw the conclusion. It sounds strange to say it, but one of the things that the just war theory takes for granted is that there is no circumstance in which you can simply suspend law. Rights are rights. And although people think that human rights are a modern invention, the fact is that in the Middle Ages there was at least a clear sense that certain things were of their nature unlawful. There might be circumstances where you found yourself driven to some very fishy expedients, but don't expect anybody to tell you that they're good start from this rather firm line that some things are illicit. The second 
principle which might perhaps translate at least as a question to ask is this. Just war theory assumes that defensible violence always needs to be sponsored by a legitimate authority. Not anybody can start a war. And that, as I hinted earlier, that is one of the most difficult areas in our contemporary setting. If we assume that the sovereign state today is exactly what it was in the Middle Ages, if we assume that authority only equals the sovereign state, we're not going to be in a very helpful position. But can we raise the question of what it is that sovereign states might yield their sovereignty to in order to create effective, authoritative international instruments? In other words, can we make the Security Council work? Can we, in some sense, create a setting in which an international consortium grounded, let's say, in the United Nations is recognized by sovereign states as an authority to which they may properly yield precedence. We got remarkably close to that in the run-up to the Iraq War, chiefly because of sheer nervousness about the risks of the engagement. And there were some of us, myself included, who were prepared to say, if the Security Council were to sanction some sort of action, that would be a game-changer morally. It wouldn't necessarily finish the question. It would shift the debate to another level. And I think that, that distinction is an important one. I suspect I might still have had grave misgivings, but I suspect that similar misgivings might have been expressed in the United Nations themselves, and we wouldn't have got to that point, but that's another story. So can we be clear about where sovereignty is limited if modern war is so much less about the conflict of sovereign states what are the organs other than sovereign states which can have credibility and authority in such an environment the third point takes us back to Yusin Bello proportion and lawfulness in the conduct of war and this is quite a simple one, really. That suggests, doesn't it, an extreme stringency about the weapons trade. There are weapons devised whose purpose is a whole range of illicit forms of damage to human beings. Cluster bombs, that kind of thing. Landmines. We are faced with a sort of parallel universe, almost, of the development of a military technology completely unconstrained by ethics. What are we going to do about it? And again, who has the authority to do something about it? We've begun, of course, with certain conventions about chemical warfare and biological warfare. And while there are obvious, um, let's say, rogue agents in that respect, something of the solidity of that still holds. It is regarded still as something of a taboo. But the use of chemical weapons, let's say by President Assad, as alleged, is only a very small sliver of a wider problem about weapons trades, trading. And we've got one example of very moderately effective intervention by the UN in the shape of the Small Arms Convention. Because we now have a, um, a convention insisting that the origins of traded small arms should be registered, it's a little bit harder to get small and light armaments into the hands of children in Sri Lanka or Africa. The Small Arms Convention has very slightly changed the climate around child soldiering. Child soldiering depends heavily on the availability of small arms. 
if you have some means of controlling the flow there, it's a little less likely that you would have that number of brutalized, abused children taking part themselves in brutality and abuse. So stringency about the weapons trade, control of the sourcing of small arms, and some, I hope, very hard questions about what the weapons trade develops through its research. Fourthly, back to the authority question, and also, I think, to, to the first of the just war principles, the last resort point. Can we identify, let's say, an international network of pretty extensively demilitarized and non-aligned states who are recognized as mediators? Can we have a clearer database, you might almost say, of those governments who are expected to exercise a mediating role when conflict threatens? The um, significance of some of the activity of the Norwegian government in Sri Lanka during recent conflict there is a case in point. But I think we need something a bit more formal, a bit more extended. So not the Security Council, we're at an earlier stage. We need, as it were, a mediation council of the United Nations, a group of demilitarized, non-aligned states who can be looked to for practical help in mediating conflict. I don't think that's rocket science myself. I really do believe that that is an achievable goal for international politics and international law. Because if just war depends on a decision that there is no alternative to violence, the question has to be put, well, how much exploration of the alternatives has actually gone on so far? And in many cases recently, of course, the answer is either not very much or it's been done through extremely unhelpful channels. It's been done in the sort of zero-sum game mentality of a lot of international face-to-face -face diplomacy rather than in a mediated context, which allows a third party to do some proper brokerage. So that doesn't seem to me utterly impossible. There's one other question which doesn't quite map onto the classical just war theory in any very direct way, but I think runs through quite a few of the issues. One of the causes for at least one form of new war these days, particularly in deeply deprived economies, is underemployment and uprooting of younger males. Part of the problem of Christian Muslim violence in northern Nigeria is not so much to do with theological argument as with a very large number of rootless young males with very limited employment opportunities. There's no way in which we can consider issues around international violence without considering the ethics of development. If we're talking about alternatives to violence, what are the alternatives to violent tribalism, in the broadest sense of tribalism, violent factionalism, for younger unemployed males particularly? You could, of course, note that it was a very similar question that underlay quite a bit of the conflict in Northern Ireland. It's not just on the other side of the world that you have to raise these questions. So what sort of investment is there in developing an economy in which there are genuine alternatives to factional violence for younger people? Can new options be created for the young? That immediately takes us into the widest possible discussion, I would say, of development questions. But I'd underline the point. There is no way in which some of these issues about conflict, violence, and bloodshed can be resolved without at the very least looking at the economic framework in which nations and communities operate. <laughs>
And if we're not prepared to tackle that, then we cannot be surprised if what happens is violence. So out of those classical principles around just war, it seems there are a few transferable, deeper principles. The just war theory may not mesh very precisely or very helpfully with the realities of conflict as we now see them, but the principles out of which a just war theory grew remain of real interest and I think real generative power. They notably pivot on notions of lawfulness. That's to say, of the preservation of a structure that protects citizens and ensures redress against abuse and violence. A structure that protects citizens and ensures redress against abuse and violence. That is what a lawful environment is. And the basic Augustinian point that you cannot defend lawfulness by unlawful means without deep contradiction and self-destruction that remains central to all this. I think that behind that in turn lies a very strong sense of to use a familiar phrase, what is due to human beings as such, which for people like myself has a very strong theological grounding, but of course is held as a principle by many people who don't have that same theological grounding, by which I mean that to say, for example, that torture is never lawful, is to say there is something about being human that makes torture an inadmissible response to any human situation. There is something about. And that something about, that, to use the jargon, that philosophical anthropology, a doctrine of the human, that is what underlies most deeply this sense that lawfulness is what it is. It's not something negotiable, changeable, according to circumstance. And if that means that your response to aggressive evil may turn out to be, in the short run, less effective than a response which would suspend law and right, well, you're going to have to cope with that and decide where you want to go with it, but not suppose that there's a, a, an easy exception clause. Nobody should be tortured unless they have to be. That's not a particularly impressive moral principle, because there will always be somebody who will tell you that this is the time when you have to. Some of you may have come across a very, very interesting, very long book by the American legal theorist Philip Bobbitt on contemporary conflict, which caused a certain amount of controversy because he spent quite a lot of that book discussing extraordinary rendition, enhanced interrogation, and so forth, and came to the, I think, interesting and nuanced conclusion that there probably were circumstances where people were going to do extraordinary and indefensible things. The world is an untidy world, like that. But as soon as you tried to theorize it, legalize it, or whatever, you'd lost not only the battle, but the argument. And I think that's, that's a, a realistic, unsentimental response. He's not saying it's ever a good thing. He's saying sometimes it happens, but God forbid that we justify it. God forbid that we try to incorporate it into a theory. So the Augustinian point about legitimacy, the attempt to identify some of those aspects of modern military technology that are most threatening to the innocent, that is my category about stringency in the weapons trade, and control of certain flows of certain kinds of weapons. That's all about the protection of the innocent. It's all about the principle of proportion, once again, and the attempt to hang on to some way of distinguishing between combatant and non-combatant. Increasingly difficult, but crucial. And behind all this, also, 
lies that lost virtue of prudence, which in medieval and classical Christian and classical classical ethics is about assessing the relation of means and ends properly and intelligently. So all the elements contained in the classical theory of just war have something to offer. They're not immediately transferable, but if we push to the roots of that theory, we will find some principles that I think are still seriously applicable. And the last thing I'd want to say, because I'm running over time a little, the last thing I'd want to say about all this is again something which I would like to hear more of from people like Mary Calder and others and which relates a bit to my point about the economy. At the moment the prevailing forms of large-scale murderous violence are either in what are called interventionist wars or in protracted uncontrollable civil conflicts in developing economies. Many people say that in 20 to 50 years' time, we will see a prevalence of conflicts about resources. That is, simple things like food and water. Access to water is an increasingly urgent thing in our world. And there are already a number of rumbling conflicts around the world that have to do with access to water supplies. Control of water supplies, um, the accessibility of long distance pipelines, for example, that can be a sort of flaring point for conflict. It's one of the less often noted aspects of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, that access to water is an issue for the Palestinian territories. So, assuming a not very hopeful scenario, not very hopeful but not unlikely scenario, that our climate environmental crisis doesn't get any easier in the next half century, it's that kind of thing which is going to provoke more and more conflict. And if the issue around food security is as serious as many people now tell us it is, that too becomes a question. I bracket out the question of access to fossil fuels and peak oil and issues like that. That in itself is enough to worry about. But I think looking even further forward, resource becomes a key trigger for conflict. So having said earlier that I don't think we can address some of these questions without being profoundly serious about economic development, I have to say also that I don't think we can address these questions without a profound seriousness about our environmental crisis. And to come back to where I started, one of the most different things about thinking about war and armed conflict in our age from what it might have been even half a century ago is that we cannot any longer isolate issues about armed conflict from those global questions of economy and ecology. It was possible, no doubt, in St. Augustine's time or St. Thomas Aquinas's time to think about war as a reasonably contained moral question, even up to the end of the 19th century. It might have seemed possible to do that. As the 20th century has unfolded, that's become less and less possible. As the 21st century opens, it is manifestly impossible to think about the ethics of war without thinking about the ethics of our economy and the ethics of our treatment of the environment. I don't say that in order to create an unmanageably diverse field of reflection, but just as a reminder that whatever we say about the ethics of armed conflict, and I think we can still say some quite robust things, there will always be that larger framework which we have to confront if we are to do justice, and let me underline the word justice there, to the humanity whose protection future, any action 
of armed force ought to have in mind, proximately or remotely. And that takes me back to Mary Calder's point that the real issue is about right, about law, conceived as the access of the ordinary human being to justice, to redress, and to protection. Unless we frame it in some such way, we'll end up, I think, doing lots of piecemeal little jobs, bits of journalistic hand-wringing, or moralistic hand-wringing, or clerical hand-wringing, for that matter, over this or that conflict. We won't have an adequate vehicle for thinking through this matter more broadly. And I don't think that we ought to underestimate the urgency of all these issues. And I hope that in what you have to share in questions and comments, that urgency will be very much to the fore in your minds. Thank you very much indeed. I think we've got about 20 minutes or so for... Thank you. Um, I, I would endorse that entirely. And I think what, what I was trying to say about um, framing this with questions about economy and ecology is, is all about what a just peace ought to be entailing. And an unjust peace is, I would take it, a situation in which conflict is denied or repressed rather than faced or addressed, where um, inequity is taken for granted or imposed, where long-term practices that are injurious to a population and its environment go unchallenged and so on. And so again, it wouldn't be surprising if that issued as unjust pieces do in unjust wars. Thank you. So. Um, Microphone coming. One issue that you, you, that you didn't mention was this aspect of <coughs> war needing to be declared. Ah. Mm. Uh, certainly, I was brought up with, 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 with that sort of, that, that was one of the essentials. Yes. Um, these days, from what you're saying, that's probably no longer quite the case. Yes. But it does seem to me that if it's a state sponsor, yeah. <coughs> Yes. Thank you. That, that's, that's crucial. Um, it comes in very much under the question of what the legitimate authority is that initiates a war. And the particular question then is, what's the process of initiating a conflict? It's interesting that you frame it um, as you do in connection with the protection, presumably, of the rights of the combatant that there is such a thing as a legitimate combatant, so to speak, which on either side of a conflict can make a difference. And, of course, one of the things which made some of the uh, curious legal resorts of um, <clears throat> the United States in the wake of the Gulf War possible was the denial that anybody fighting against American forces was a legitimate combatant. And that does lead to some rather hair-raising consequences. So I think we've got some work to do on this. But I, I want to connect it with my question about whether 
a sovereign state can and should make a formal remission of a decision to another body, which then makes a you know, publicly recognizable decision, creating a state of competency. And I, I don't think we can avoid that as, as an issue. It's certainly true that um, <clears throat> most of the conflicts we've seen in the last two or three decades, perhaps a bit more, have not been declared. Nobody does a sort of Neville Chamberlain type broadcast to the nation saying, as from such and such an hour, we are at war with. We, as it were, wake up and look around and discover that, oh yes, we have troops on the ground somewhere, and we're not quite sure how they got there. Thank you. I, I was waiting for somebody to ask about Crimea. <laughs> um, it seems to me that the, whatever one thinks about the rights and wrongs of um, factions and groupings within Ukraine, the annexation of Crimea is a legally pretty dubious venture. No two ways about that. To have as it were, a plebiscite in a certain region of another sovereign state and declare that therefore you can annex it seems to me a, a deeply worrying um, rerun of things that happened in the 1930s. That being said, I'm wary, as you'll have gathered, of interventionist action. I'm wary of any military action to defend Ukraine against Russia. I'm looking hard to see what further diplomatic as well as sanction-based initiatives may follow. Because I don't think it's simply um, a case of wicked and aggressive Russia and plucky little Ukraine. I think there, there are there are more very complex issues there, not least as in so many such questions, the inherent instability of Ukraine as, as a sovereign state. That is, it's, it's one of those rather awkwardly cobbled together sovereign units, which is quite likely to fall apart into East and West under pressure. So, like most people, a rather perplexed reaction as to what we should do but a measure of clarity about the fact that Russia is quite clearly behaving unlawfully and doesn't hurt to say so. Now what we then do in my ideal world this would be the sort of case where you'd send for the Norwegians or whatever <laughs> where there would be um, a recognized international vehicle able to provide mediation able to suggest solutions I say suggest because imposing solutions is, is rather difficult. I suspect that what we'll see in the next five years is Russia holding on very firmly to Crimea and doing a little bit of gentle destabilization of Ukraine from time to time without ever quite going to war. It's what Russia tends to do with its smaller neighbors. Look at Georgia. It just goes on sort of leaning over and wobbling it, you know from time to time, creating a certain amount of panic, a certain amount of international hand-wringing, and in the long run, a slight strengthening of Russia's strategic position, which is exactly what Russia wants. Somebody said to me not long ago that the, uh, the great and important difference between Russian and American foreign policy was that Americans expected to be loved and were deeply hurt and pained when that didn't happen internationally. Russians know they're not going to be, and so they don't give a damn. <laughs> and that means that in many of the diplomatic exchanges, the Russians do have an extra set of cards. Yeah. Uh, 
I doubt very much whether we're going to convince the world overnight that there is such a thing as natural law. But I think it's all the more important in a world with a lot of cynicism and a lot of, a lot of pragmatism around to be able to... It's very important that there should be some communities that are robustly convinced that the reason human beings are worth protecting is non-negotiable. It's to do with the purposes of God, let's say. That's where I would start and more or less what I would stop. You know, human beings are made in the image of God, therefore they are to be protected, they are to be guaranteed redress, they are to be regarded as lawful persons, lawful subjects. And unless there are some elements, some communities, some cultural strands in the world represented largely, though not exclusively, by religious bodies, it's not surprising if some of that becomes unclear and you end up with people saying, well, maybe we could stretch a point here. So even if we don't persuade, we can witness. And if, even if witness doesn't immediately persuade, it makes, it makes slightly more awkward the lives of those who deserve to have their lives made awkward in this context. So we just stick out that. So in fact. <coughs> That's a very, very interesting question, actually. I, I, I'd love to have a much longer discussion of it. Um, broadly, I'd go for the latter. Um, but let me just think out loud a moment about this, because it, it really is a very crucial question. Um, the problem in many contexts where war spills over boundaries is, of course, that there is not a sufficiently strong state identity. Um, and actually, what some nations need is a, a clearer national identity and sense of national sovereignty. That is, a functioning state apparatus. Um, again, it's been said, and I'm not sure I'd put my shirt on this, but it's an interesting observation, that China has an enormously strong state apparatus and rather weak civil, rather weak civil society, almost non-existent civil society in some ways. Russia has a weak state apparatus and a weakened civil society compensated for only by very, very strong centralized leadership, which is not a very happy combination. Russia needs, paradoxically, more sense of its its identity as a lawful state. So does Congo or South Sudan or Sri Lanka. So one step in the whole process, I'd say, is a strengthening of the state apparatus in the sense of the state as a sovereign legal body. And then, for those of us who inherit a, a tradition of rather more robust sovereign independence like the UK we then need I think to recognise that that level of sovereignty and lawfulness is part of a jigsaw. It's not that we end up so to speak with lots of sovereign bubbles not communicating not um, discerning together the risk of the I suppose post 17th century post Treaty of Westphalia world reinforced to some extent by the Treaty of Versailles danger of that is the silo nation, the nation which has you know, firmed up its boundaries and folds its arms and says, well, here, here I stand, and I will defend this, this patch of earth against everybody else. Um, essentially, a competitive view of sovereignty where the world just breaks down into independent sovereign units. Because the problems of our world are such that no one sovereign state can tackle any of them very significantly, we have to have collaborative structures. 
epidemic disease, environmental crisis, to take my two favorite examples here, are not national problems. And to combat them effectively, there needs to be some qualification of a sense of absolute national sovereignty. I think it should be the same with, with armed conflict. So what I'm saying, sorry, long-winded reply, but it's a really interesting and intelligent question. Um, what I'm saying, I think, is strengthening the state as a lawful sovereign body is part of a trajectory, part of a story, whose final logic is to strengthen not, an in, not a world government, but a set of participatory, accountable, effective international instruments. That's part of the same story. Thank you. We've got time for this question and probably one, one more after that. <clears throat> You're quite right to pick me up on that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think I was referring to the way in which classical just war theory tends to talk about the protection of the innocent, that is, the people who, are, who in this particular context have not done you any harm. You know, that, that's clear. Um, I don't want myself to go into the innocent and guilty language. Um, so combatant and non-combatant is, is a much more responsible way of addressing it. I, I accept the correction and the implicit question behind it. Um, as, as is often said, if you want to talk about innocence, it's really quite difficult in the modern world where anyone participating actively in a national economy will in some sense be contributing to the military capacity of that nation, which is why um, people bomb factories in, in wartime. But I think it's still quite important to have some pretty clear distinction between people who are actively involved in direct combat and those who are not. Otherwise, proportion goes out of the window. Just very back. And I'll take that question now and then that will be where we'll bring the proceedings to a close. <coughs> Yes, um, it worries me deeply. It's not a new problem in the sense, of course, that in the 1950s, President Eisenhower famously talked about the military-industrial complex and the way in which um, technology was driven not so much by immediate military need as by imagined, projected military need which itself began to drive strategy. And more recently, of course, the, the other form of war profiteering, if you like, which is opening up a country to, to trade, to commerce. The franchising of vast amounts of security responsibility in Iraq to private companies and all that goes with that that seems to me a morally very questionable side of all this because you have to ask what then drives any decision I've been trying to say that we need to um, to recover a sense of decisions being driven not by those mechanisms that have to do with profit and trade but by highly specific issues about law I think we are dangerously unclear about that and the history of the last decade is very worrying from that point of view. Last questions over here. Um, <laughs> um probably not. I well let, let's let's 
for the moment, leave the Second World War. Um, <laughs> but I, th I think that there... I, yes, I'm, I broadly agree about the Second World War, for the record, though I think that um, there are some very, very murky episodes in terms of use in bello method at times there. However, has there been one since? My best candidate, for what it's worth, is Tanzanian intervention in Uganda in Amin's last days. Cambodia? Possibly, yes. yes. But th those are issues where I think one can make the case along the lines I've suggested. And while they are, in a sense, interventionists, they're, interestingly, neighbor states saying, we are being destabilized, we are being made unviable as a state by the burden of refugees, by the, uh, the aggression of a neighbor. Um, and this is an aggressive...